Gina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's great to see you. So congratulations on your new book, Purpose. It's a Wall Street Thank Journal you. bestseller. Oh, it's it so great. is. It is. And I have so appreciated your support, especially I think in the very, very early days. And you know this from writing a book. When you literally have had your friends read it or maybe like a family member and people sort of... Uh, concentric circles outside start to read it and they're like, oh, it's good. It's like, really? Oh, that's great. I love hearing that. Thank you. <laughs> so you were that person to me and I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so glad. And it's funny that you bring that up because when I wrote my first book, the two things, you know, the, the, actually the, the one thing that I was most worried about was that people I respected, my friends and those concentric circles were going to read the book and say, huh, it's not that good. Oh, well. <laughs> And, and when they we still said, like oh, her, she's still our friend. Totally. Yeah. Still yeah. Like her. She's, she's good at other things, but I guess this <laughs> book's not one of them. So your book, which I've read is really good. Um, it's, it's, it's based, I know on a course that you had developed, um, as part of your work running, uh, Mighty Networks, but can you tell us about the, um, kind of what, what caused you to actually go through the effort of, of writing a book, which is no easy task and, um, what the purpose of purpose is. Yeah. So I, in teaching this community design class, so the, the promise of the course is uh, create a community so valuable that you can charge for it relevant to your, to your audience. And so um, basically self-organizing and easy to run that you actually want to run it. Uh, and so in doing this work of designing and scaling communities, and I've, I had a, I've had a front row seat to, gosh, at this point, over 3 million different communities created. And in this work, what I keep coming back to and keep seeing is just how closely tied community is with purpose. And I define purpose as the clear, positive intention for our time, our talents, our focus, and our energy for our brief time on planet Earth. And especially over the last three years, if, as people have been asking themselves the question, I'm sure, you know, I certainly have asked myself the question, I, I'm, I'm assuming you might have as well, which is, what am I doing? Like, is, what is this all for? And in a moment and a time of, of really pretty profound and rapid change, having a practice around that clear positive intention for our time, talents, energy, and focus for our brief time on planet earth has only become more important. And so as I started to take some of the things that I had figured out worked in the context of community design and started to sort of bring them into a much earlier experience of just an individual being able to, to, to build again, a practice around their purpose. Um, it worked and worked really, really well for people. And so I decided to turn it into a book so that more people could potentially take advantage of and, and that I could invite them into these practices and ways of just grounding ourselves in purpose, in impact, in being able to answer that question of what am I doing? Like, what is this all for uh, in, a, in a more thoughtful and proactive way? Um, and, and just, you know, given, given the response to the book, uh, and the people sharing their, their stories of implementing some of these practices, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored and I'm humbled and I'm like so excited to get it out to more and more people because life is truly too short to not have a clear positive intention for our time, our talents, our energy, and our focus. Uh, and, and if I can do my part in that, um, and helping people find that, then I'm, I'm probably doing something right. So, so is it fair to say this isn't really necessarily a business book so much as mm -hmm. it's a, a very personal book? Correct. It's not a business book. It is really about how finding your purpose and making it matter is core to our experience as human beings. And no amount of technology, no amount of innovation, no amount of time spent in front of our devices changes the fact that as human beings, we want to be a part 
of something bigger than ourselves. We want to have a clear and positive intention. We want to have purpose. Uh, we want to take on challenges, even if we don't think we want to take on challenges. If you just look at how we evolve and how we uh, have the most energy, what we put in our bodies, all of these things, it really is about how do we take on challenges? How do we strive for mastery? How do we do something that we didn't think was possible? And to me, that is when I really reflect on it, it's like that is a well-lived life. Yeah. So this is so interesting. Because I'm, I'm wondering right now, I'm just thinking about who's listening and I'm like, are they, they're wondering, are we, are we listening to subscription stories? Because this sounds like it's a whole order of magnitude. You're like, when are, when are we talking about LTV? When are we talking about LTV people? I thought this was a, I thought this was a woman who, who runs the, the, the community platform, for, you know, for people building, yeah. building online communities. So, so I want to come back to purpose. That too. And, and, that too. And, uh, that too. I'll, also that. Also that. <laughs> but what I what I I want to come back to purpose, and I want to come back to future story, and and how people do this, and how people find meaning, and the whole kind of COVID, you know, what am I doing here anyway? Question. But before we do that, I want to make that connection between. Okay, you are the founder and CEO of Mighty Networks, one of the you know most successful, fastest growing, totally capturing the zeitgeist community platforms uh, that sells to organizations and businesses of, of all sizes to help them build, you know, a, a key part of their business model. Mm -hmm. um, how did you rationalize making time for this? Was this like a totally separate compartment of your life? Or do you see opportunities uh, for dovetailing what you were doing with your work on on purpose and, and values and what you do at uh, every day um, running your, your, your company? Well, we as human beings are made for community. Like we are, we are physically, emotionally, psychologically made for community. So my work in terms of selling software is, is in service to the human experience. And I know that that sounds so lofty, but it's true. And it is especially true for the kind of software that um, I, I have obsessively built for the last you know decade plus. And so when I started just continuing to just move up to you know that 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 uh, you know that exercise where people are like, well, just keep asking why, yeah, and you yeah. just like keep asking why and and ask why and then ask why some more. So when I did that, it really comes down to if if I lived in a world where people had a much clearer sense of their purpose, they would see the value of community, but more importantly, know how to do it, or at least be motivated to know how to do it. What happens when more people know how to run or host a community or courses or memberships or events. Well, so number one, I think that the world is a better place. It, it just is. It's we can have connection. We can we can belong to something bigger than ourselves. Um, and if in the process I'm able to sell more software, fantastic. But software is always going to be in service of a mission and a bigger mission, which is how, you know, how am I just as an individual, but also as a leader? And then how is my team? How are we able to integrate and blend people's missions and what they want to accomplish in their lives with actually being able to do that easily and effectively? Uh, that's, that's how I've chosen to live my life. And it's why I love being an entrepreneur. There's a lot of things that suck about being an entrepreneur, if anybody, <laughs> I, like I don't necessarily recommend it to everybody. But the the main thing is that, Robbie, I can write a book about purpose and it is aligned with my my purpose and my company and and the category that we are building around cultural software and really this ability for brands and creators and individuals to design and scale really new cultures. So as I think about that, it, it wasn't necessarily a side project, but I also did it pretty fast and almost so fast that I was like, oh my gosh, am I really doing this? And the answer was yes, I was. And I did. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's like I said, I think it's a very good book. 
Um, and I say that even when I'm not interviewing you, I've said it to a lot of people. I appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, what I take away from what you said, and one of the things I think is important, and I've known you, we've known each other for, for quite a while now, is you've always been around bringing people together and helping people achieve their goals, their, their missions, their purpose. And I feel like, you know, a lot of companies and a lot of organizations, when they build when they say, you know, it's time to launch a community, we should have a community. So whatever, so we can be stickier, so we can make more money, so we can sell it, whatever So that we it can have first party data. That's a yeah, good one. Yeah, so we, right, first party data. We want, we which need you, first party data. Which you also data. get, yeah. Which you also right, get. right, no, I mean, these are all, in my opinion, tails wagging the dog, right? Like, it's yeah. great, but why does your customer want to be a member of your community? Um, why would somebody spend their time? And I think for a lot of these organizations, there's like this missing link between the two. It's like, you got to go back and say, what is that ongoing goal that I'm helping these people achieve? Mm -hmm. What is this ongoing problem um, that I'm helping people solve? I just saw a community for, um, I think it's called the Bariatric Society. I just thought right before, before we start talking for people who've gone through weight loss surgery, right? Yeah. And like, of course they come together and what are they trying to do? They're trying to optimize health. They're trying to maintain the results that they've achieved. Um, nobody else is going to understand that like somebody else is going through it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful to see. And I think that's really from my, when I read the book, I was like, oh, you're really focusing at the beginning and saying, okay, mm -hmm. let's take a step back. Let's talk about what our, what our, and I don't want to keep naming the book, what our purpose is, what is it that we're trying to do here? And right. then it'll be so much easier to build an engaged community because right. it's building an engaged community is really hard. Well, I, I here I would I would I would challenge that. I think building an engaged community is really hard if you do not have a big purpose for the community, a motivation for those members to show up and contribute that is directly tied to their results that they want in their lives, the transformation that they want to have, the people that they want to meet, the things that they want to belong to. So uh, when I really look at like what granularly do you have to have in a community, you have to have a motivation for people to show up and contribute. And then the second piece that you need, especially today, is comfort and confidence in being able to define the culture of your community. Here is what we do here so that somebody doesn't have to guess. Mm -hmm. And it's one of it's one of these things that I I really find somewhat shocking is how in any other area of our lives we understand the power of cultural norms or, and 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 social norms but when it comes to online communities, the first thing we want to set up is rules. We want to, you know, and, and the rules have gotten to be so extreme of like, sh you know, you can show up at this community, but then like, don't murder anybody. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's actually, like, that's not the biggest problem here. The biggest problem is I don't know anybody. I don't know what the norms are here of this community. Um, like, for example, do we direct message each other? Is somebody going to respond to me? If I send somebody a message or if I respond to a, a question, are people going to think well of me or are they going to think that I'm, you know, a, a dum dum? Like, what is the, what give me the rules of the game or the agreements that we make in this organic system such that I know how to win. I know how to be well-received. I know how to have credibility or for people to like me. And I think one of the most powerful things that makes a community easy to do is, again, a very simple big purpose, which, you know, we have a, a, a very clear, like it's kind of a clear and obvious formula for it. It's like, who do you bring together? What are you going to do together? And what are you going to get for doing those things? Not a mission statement not a, you know, not a, not a marketing page, but simply uh, synthesizing down to its, its essence. Who do you serve? Back of the pack, slow runners. What are you going to do together? You're going to build training plans and you're going to start, you know, training for that first race so that we can be comfortable in our bodies, no matter what, you know, what our, um, our size or shape or level of fitness is and have incredible relationships in pursuit of the beauty of movement. 
So that's an example for a, a community that I love called the Slow AF Run Club. That's an example of a big purpose. And then you have to match that up with, okay, this is what we do on, you know, this month's theme is your first 5K. Uh, we have a weekly calendar and on Tuesday mornings at nine o'clock, we've got a, a live stream check-in. And on Thursdays, we have a question of the week. And on Mondays, we have a gratitude practice. And that's it. That's what we do in this community. And then every once in a while, you know, as it, as marathon season's coming, we'll spin out and, and launch a new group or a new course or a new subscription training program um, for training for your first marathon. And it mm -hmm. will cost money and we'll bring together those people that are at that point in time. And that's what we do here. And every member who signs up and joins us in the Slow AF Run Club, we make an agreement that if somebody reaches out to us, we'll respond. Yeah. That, that just, that's not hard. It's just being willing to say, this is what we do here. There's, there's here so today. many, there's so many lessons in this that I want to just pull out. So one of them is you know, how do you kind of get focused on your purpose? And you, you have that nice three part, you know, this is who it's for. This is the outcome or the ongoing outcome that you can expect. And this is how we do it together. You know, what we're going to do to help you achieve that ongoing outcome or, or goal. And that's, that's super simple. And then you gave a great example of, you know, it, you don't have to do a thousand things. You don't have to have you know, a catalog of articles and 27 meetings a week and private coaching and, three courses, you can just start with something really simple that's going to help them achieve whatever that ongoing goal is, whatever that mission is. Right. Um, and then you talked about the importance of culture uh, online. And I totally agree with you that that people don't really know how to establish culture. They, they know it when they see it online. Like we're all parts of at least, you know, most of us, at least one community where we're like, it just feels good. Like I feel safe. Um, I know what's going to happen. I know if I put a question up, somebody will respond. I know if I say something rude, someone will shut me down. Robbie, what you're describing is you understand the culture. Yeah, exactly. I understand, understand the, culture. the culture. And there's there's an onboarding process and there's an ongoing, you know, there's there's orchestration of that. It doesn't, I think a lot of organizations think I'm just going to, I'm just going to turn on that software that you talked about and I'm going to throw some people on it and it's just going to, they're yeah. just going to, I'm not going to tell them what to do with it. I'm not going to tell them what their goal should be. I'm not going to tell them who should be here. We're just going to see what happens. And, and right. That or, is a or, or another, another thing I hear regularly is, well, I want my, I want my community to decide. Right. I want to take their lead. No one has enough time in the day to take, here's the way it really works with community. I think about it as the, um, is to listen and adapt. You need to have a point of view. Like to run a community well, you have to start with a point of view and you have to surprise and delight people with, with what those norms are, what that culture is. And we have so many ideas because we love this stuff and we're obsessed with it at Mighty. Um, so if anybody wants to write me or like reach out, we have got all sorts of fun interesting, cool ways of building culture um, in your community. But fundamentally, what you want to do is have a point of view and then listen for the reaction. Listen yeah. and adapt. You want to try new things, but it, it's a little bit, it, it, did you, have you ever gone out? This used to happen to me, certainly in high school, a lot, where it's like you'd go out with a group of friends and it, you'd basically be like, okay, well, where are we going to go for dinner? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? Yeah. And, you know, an hour in we're starving because nobody right. is making the decision about where we're going to go to dinner. Yeah. And it's and, such a relief when somebody <laughs> says, Hey, I was thinking we could get burgers. Is that good? Right. And then you listen. And sometimes people are like, no, nobody wants burgers. We're all vegan. Right. Let's exactly. go get a salad. And you're like, okay, great. Like boom, boom. Right. And so it is, and it's so valuable when somebody you know, I think a lot of people are very reluctant to take a leadership position, yeah. to have a point of view, but really in most cases, everybody else is grateful and it's a good starting point. And that's one of the reasons why we use the term host. It is not about 
it, like, you know, I think the whole thing about expertise or s- building your personal brand or, or have to be an influencer, it just puts too much pressure on people. Really, what you, what you are doing with the community is you are playing the role of convener. You are hosting people coming together. And if you can shine a light on what makes them special and makes them a part of this community and what we can go do together. We, we talk about what you can go do together in a community is quests. And quests are, really, we define them as four things. Online courses, because people want to be able to learn. They want to be able to go deeper. Um, I think a lot of people are used to paying for online courses, uh, and they are incredibly valuable. The second kind of quest is a challenge. There are people that have built incredible businesses on challenges as a way to activate a community. Then there's experiences. What's an example of a challenge? Uh, A a challenge might be a uh, dry January is a challenge. Couch couch to 5K is a challenge. (laughs) You know, these, the, where, where you get something at the end of it, or you have done something for roughly 30 days. A great example is yoga with Adrian, um, one of our one of our uh, communities, and she's got obviously a large YouTube following if you are familiar with her. Yep. And they do a 30 day yoga challenge every January. And that has brought together a community over 223,000 members who are coming together in that challenge and then staying for that community design plan, those, those, those month, that big purpose, that year in the life, what, what is, what is your community and members able to do a year from now that they're not able to do today, which is really the value and why people will pay to be a part of a community, uh, or join for join a community because of what they're able to learn. Uh, and then, just to finish the community design plan, then you have a weekly calendar or monthly themes, a weekly calendar and daily, daily questions or daily polls, which is really just a way of saying daily activity that your members ultimately take over. So you don't have to do everything, anything every day in a community. And that works really, really well. Quests though, we have online courses, challenges, experiences, And I think about experiences as events surrounded in the warmth, in in, in the warm embrace of a community. And then lastly, collabs or collaborations between members, because ultimately, if you can create collaborations, which might be a mastermind group, or it might be a, um, a small group that is is playing out future scenarios like they do. And so collabs might be, you know, small groups, masterminds, um, certifications is, is another really interesting way of collaborating. Anything that really allows and enables your members to have a, a clear way of building things together with other members. Yeah. Yeah. What you just went through is very helpful I think for people who are trying to figure out what do I actually do with my, what do I do do with it? How do I see it? Right. I have, and and let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that. Cause I think it's so important. So here is the thing. What do you do when you're like, okay, I'm ready to go. Like, what do I do first? The most important thing, 80% of, of the impact of your community is going to be your big purpose. Why are people coming together? Because if there is clarity around why they are coming together, they are going to be predisposed to contribute because you've been really clear right up front before they've ever joined with, as we do these things together, and I'll give you, I'll give you a couple examples, but as we do these things together, here is what you are going to get for it. So as they have motivation, which is very different than sort of learn, share, and grow together, that's that's generic at this point. Like mm-hmm. no one knows what that means. It's a little bit like the word engagement. No one really knows what engagement means. Like it means so many different things to so many different people. It doesn't mean anything. So your big purpose, who are you bringing together? And the clearer you are on who you are bringing together, back of the pack runners, slow runners, or uh, women who are uh, navigating 
just having a baby uh, and, and what they want to do in this new world, in this new chapter, by the way, do you start to see something that's really interesting about communities that, and the most motivated people, they tend to be in transitions. Yeah. So the more that you can, especially for a membership business or a subscription business, the more that you can think about your ideal members or the people who need your community the most right now. And I think about it as like right now is an all caps. Yeah. The more that you can focus in on someone's a transition in their lives, the more motivated somebody's going to be to show up. They're like, oh my gosh, that's me. I'm in that transition. I would like to be a part of this community. So that might be, you know, high school seniors who are graduating and planning on taking a gap year or um, young professionals in their first year out of college in their first job. You know, you just go down the list of people's transitions and there is a community that is that, that there is demand for in each of those transitions. So yeah. and the reason I'm spending time on this is because when you get this right, everything else gets easier. Yeah. A, a comment about um, transitions. I saw that Bruce Feiler was one of your, mm -hmm. um, gave a blurb on the back of your book and um, he's a mutual friend and he wrote a book, Life is in the Transitions. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all about all the different types of trans. He's, he's done a tremendous amount of work breaking down what all those transitions are in someone's life. So if you're looking for a transition to try to inspire you to think about what is, you know, what is that moment? Um, I think that's a, that's a, a good place to, to, to we, check out. We actually, and it, that is such a great book. He is fantastic. And we actually came up with and have a guide to creating your big purpose that if somebody just wants to send me an email, I'm happy to send it to them or, you know follow me on LinkedIn and I'll send it to you. Um, but basically those transitions. And then once you have that, the simplest thing that you can do, like, like you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so busy. I can't possibly organize a community or host one. It's too much work. Maybe I'll do that in a few months. The easiest thing that you can do once you get the transition or get the big purpose right is just set up a weekly calendar two days a week. And maybe it's just, you know, a six o'clock happy hour over a live stream, or maybe it is the question of the week. It does not need to be a lot if your big purpose is clear. Yeah. Is so, so what if things, I mean, we've talked a lot about getting things started, right? The early part mm -hmm. of, of building community, finding your purpose, um, you know, establishing something, starting small, what happens if things go really well um, and it grows really fast and it's overwhelming? Um, what do you, what do you do then? I know you alluded to the idea that if you, if you build it right and you structure it right and you set up the right culture, um, it, it kind of takes care of itself, but, but how do you, how do you make sure that it's, that it's not going to get out of control? Well, so let's talk about that. Um, so, so first and foremost, there are things that when you, again, have a really clear big purpose that you can break people off into these different quests, it, it doesn't get out of control. Um, now, somebody who might have been in a spicy Facebook group might be saying to me, Gina, that's super naive. Haven't you ever been in a spicy Facebook group? Uh, and I would argue slash suggest that the spicy Facebook groups have much more to do with Facebook than they do with community. So I'll, I'll, I'll share an example. So coming back to yoga with Adrian. So they had a 35,000 person Facebook group and before they moved to Mighty. And they actually found that it was weird. It's, it was weirdly spicy. So it was weirdly uh, toxic. And people would show up and they would be talking politics and, and angry with other members over yoga. Uh, and they moved to Mighty in part because they were like, this is too much. This is hard to manage. Like, this is not fun. When they moved to Mighty and they were able to build a new culture with new norms because they had 
community. They had the ability to have chat, but they also to have a feed. They were able to ask questions. They were able to organize by topics or hashtags. They were able to do uh, events and live streaming and it courses all in one place. What they found was that the same, they could ask the same question in both places and get fundamentally different answers. So because of the culture uh -huh. and because, and because of the infrastructure. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, we do some things behind the scenes that you don't need to like know a ton about, like personalizing it to what you as a member are following or what you care about or the groups that you're a part of or the spaces that you're in. And so now because of this focus on, again, designing and scaling culture, we as a platform are set up that you can have in, in entirely different kind of member profiles experiencing your community in very different ways by organizing them into these spaces or think about them as like rooms in a house and then decorating them with different features, um, kind of like different, different kinds of furniture in those rooms um, really effectively. So you can scale your community so much more effectively, so much easy, more easily. That's what we have found. And so, you know, the, the folks that are like, oh my gosh, it's too, you know, I'm going to have a problem because once this thing gets to a million, you know, a million members, it's going to fall apart. It won't, it's fine. Uh, I, th I think the, the hardest thing and really the thing to, to pay attention to is it is so tempting to be general. It is so tempting to want to build a community for all humans of planet earth. It, it is, it just is. And so, especially if you have a framework or you have a, a methodology that you feel will help people of all shapes and sizes and backgrounds and of all transitions and all hopes and dreams and fears and misconceptions, the, the challenge is that if you don't that might be true, but if you don't draft behind the fact that your members want to meet other people like themselves, you're just making your life harder and it's unnecessary. Right, so ultimately it's about um, bringing people together under your umbrella, um, giving them a safe space where they know that everybody else there shares the same culture. purpose, same yeah. culture, um, both of those things, right? The, the purpose and the culture are both important. Um, and then it makes it easy. Everything, everything goes faster and grows more easily. Mm -hmm. Um, so what do you do? You know, we've talked a lot this, you know, we're sort of going back and forth here, you know, between kind of the, the personal and the professional, right? So yeah. there's also, you know, some of these communities that you've talked about are, are very personal. Um, but, but you also have uh, companies that you work with where there, oh, know, yes. there might be a community manager, right? Or yeah. you might have that title. That's what you got hired to do. And then maybe you're called a host and that helps you reframe what your role is. Right. Um, but how do you balance that and sort of find the purpose of your organization when, when yes. you're working, you know, for a product company or what have it's, you? It's a great question. So, you know, with over 8,000 people who have been through the community design masterclass, um, we, we have a fair number of people who are working for brands and working for nonprofit organizations and companies. And the thing that I would say, and, and some of the brands that we work with are TED uh, and um, Fortune and Sports Illustrated and Mind Body. So we're not just a platform for um, for individuals to, to become hosts of, of communities or, or courses. And for a for a community manager, and I, again, I think this this evolution from this idea of managing a community to designing the culture of a community is a really important shift, because when you design the culture of a community, you are setting it up to run itself, and you are setting it up to get value. For your mem to attract your members and for them to get value in a way that is, it it's it's just an incredible. It, it's one of these things that that when I talk to folks that have been running communities and scaling communities, it's it's like I don't exactly know what it is 
that is so special about it, but it is so special. And I think what it is, is watching people unlock results and transformation in their lives that they cannot otherwise get outside of the structure of a community. And so for a community manager or designer, what is your connection to the brand? Yeah. So How you really is have the to care? Yeah, have to care. I don't think it can be uh I don't I don't think that it can be a job that you kind of mail it in. Um and if anything the essence of a community there's always something interesting. So if you just even take, you know, oh, well I'm going to create a a customer community for our enterprise software. Well, those people that you may think of as sort of nameless, faceless, you know, pocketbooks, they're human beings. They have love. They have, they have interests. They have desires to connect with other people. They, they want to solve the puzzles and the, and the riddles of how to make the most out of what you offer. They want the results and transformation in their lives that they can't get on their own. They want to understand alongside other people who are like them um, on the same path, what is happening in the world, this world of rapid change. The world, every, anytime we think that it's going to slow down and we can just catch our breath, you know, something else shows up that, that is fundamentally different and creates a different world than we even had months ago. And we are now in our third and fourth iteration of this, just even in the last three years. And so as we look at that, the only way to navigate rapid change and new challenges and uh, and in many cases ordeals and difficulties is through the power of community. So even that enterprise software developer community should have a culture and an impact on people's lives that take advantage of the fact that a community is the single most effective way to navigate rapid change. Yeah, a I community think... is the single most effective way to build new practices and change habits. And a community is the single most effective way to innovate and, and really create change in people's lives. Yeah, it's it's interesting the 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 point about the the enterprise you know enterprise software manager kind of role or you know database manager things like that which seem very like you said a human pocketbook or a human machine, um, but they they want to um, they want to do good work they want to be recognized for that work they want to be recognized for the contribution they're making to the bigger team. And I think in some cases, those groups are even more valuable than some of the ones that feel more mission based because nobody else is investing in them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I almost feel like the places where you might feel the most alone are the places that are most ripe for for community. Mm -hmm. um, so super interesting. I, I, I could talk to you all day. Um, and, and would love to have an all day to talk to you. Uh, but I know you have a million more meetings for the rest of the day. And I, I'm wondering if I can close out with uh, a speed round. We did sure. this last time. And uh, I love speed rounds. So fun. Okay. Um, first community you were ever a part of? My church. Uh, most meaningful community you're part of today? It's It's really a group of three friends and their husbands that we refer to ourselves as the gems of the Danube uh, because we took a trip there. Oh, I love that. Um, and what's important about that group? What is the purpose? This group, we are going through life together. High highs, low lows, and they are the group of people that I can be the most honest with and they can be the most honest with us as well. I love it. That might be another book. Um, Besides yours, what I would call it, I would call it Gems of the Danube, 2019. No, keep going, sorry. 
I love it. I, I, sign me up. I want an early edition. Um, okay. Besides yours, one book you'd recommend to this audience of subscription professionals thinking about community. I loved the book, Never Lose a Customer Again by Joey Coleman. Oh, great, great book. Um, good one. And then finally, uh, best advice for an entrepreneur writing a book. Find a friend who is, who can basically ask you the question, what are you trying to say? <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I don't think, so I've, I've lots of, this is less of a speed round, but I will say that ghostwriter you think exists doesn't, and you are much better off not trying to outsource to a ghostwriter a book. If you, if you feel the calling to write a book, you are much better off carving out the time and having a friend or an editor or somebody essentially play the role of editor to when you get stuck, unstick you. Yes. That is that is more important than trying to find a ghostwriter. Because the problem with the ghostwriter is that they have to live in your brain as an expert and they can't become an expert fast enough. So then you're like, oh, if I really actually want to do this fast because I've got a day job it's actually faster for me to just write it myself, at which point you have to ask yourself the question, what if I get stuck? And getting unstuck, I think is the hardest thing. Yeah, yeah. That's, it takes think, a village. It, it takes a village and you have to do it yourself. You have to be the, the leader of the village. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's not, you know, writing your best ideas is not something that somebody else can do for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so, that's so true. And it's, um, yeah, yeah. I. I wish somebody had told me that when I started writing my first book. Um, it's it's great advice. Uh, thank you for joining us, Gina, and for coming back a second time. I think you know um, your first episode uh, with Subscription Stories, most popular episode of all time. Uh, your your content is great, and your generosity is is unsurpassed in terms of your your profound desire to help. Uh, individuals find their purpose and share it to uh, make the world a better place. So thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Robbie. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. That was returning guest Gina Bianchini, founder and CEO of Mighty Networks and author of the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Purpose. For more about Gina and her new bestseller, Purpose, go to www.purpose.co. For more about Mighty Networks, go to www.mightynetworks.com. And for more about subscription stories, as well as a transcript of my conversation with Gina, go to robbiekelmanbaxter.com slash podcast. Also, if you like what you heard, please go over to Apple Podcasts or Apple iTunes and leave a review. Mention Gina and this episode if you especially enjoyed it. Reviews are how listeners find our podcast and we appreciate each one. Thanks for your support. And thanks for listening to Subscription Stories.